Hi, my name is Robin Morrison and I'm a postdoc with the Diane Foss Gorilla Fund and I'm going to talk to you today about respiratory disease transmission in mountain gorillas. So a lot of research in the last 20 years has demonstrated the terrible effects that infectious disease is having in wild ape populations. And partly this is due to the fact that they're so closely related to humans and can catch many of the same diseases as us. And this is likely to be exacerbated further by COVID-19, which we know that gorillas can also catch. So we need to find ways to reduce this problem. And one strategy is to use data from past outbreaks using things like social data and health data to understand how diseases are transmitting through these wild populations and using this to guide our conservation strategies. I work at the Karasoki Research Center in Rwanda, where scientists have been monitoring mountain gorillas since 1967. And this means there's a huge amount of data on things like their health and also the patterns of social interaction, which is just the sorts of data we need to understand how diseases are transmitting in the population. So since 2004, there have been 15 respiratory infection outbreaks in the population that we monitor. And we also have a huge amount of data on the patterns of social interaction during that same period. So we collect data on which individuals are in physical contact and also how often individuals are within five meters of each other. And so we can use all of this to build social networks to understand the patterns of interaction going on in the population when these outbreaks happen. So for each outbreak, we built two social networks, one based on proximity and one based on contact. And we looked at whether we could predict who would get sick during these outbreaks based on the social network. First, we looked at whether those with symptoms were more closely connected in these networks than we would expect by chance. But we didn't find that this was the case. Then we also looked at whether those with higher network centrality, so those that were better connected in their groups, were more likely to show symptoms. But again, we didn't see this. And this is really different to what we see in most other animal species and most other outbreaks. In a number of these outbreaks, we were seeing that the diseases were just transmitting incredibly quickly. So for example, almost all of this group becomes infected by only day three, showing that this network of really interconnected individuals with lots of social interactions enables these diseases to spread really quickly. In other cases, they spread a little bit more slowly. And to begin with, they tended to spread to the social contacts of those that were already infected, but it rapidly spread throughout the group. We also looked at the capacity for disease to transmit between different groups. And we did this looking at transfers, when a gorilla moves from one group to another, encounters where these groups approach each other, or range overlaps. So to what extent the area used by one group overlaps with the area used by another group. What we found is that transfers were taking place in 20% of outbreaks and encounters in 27% of outbreaks. So these were fairly common, but in none of these instances did they cause an outbreak in a previously uninfected group. When we looked at range overlap, we found no evidence that simultaneously infected groups had greater range overlap with each other than those of uninfected groups. And so this is really not what we would expect at all if gorillas were infecting their neighbors. So we haven't found any evidence between group transmission of these respiratory infections. So how are they reaching new groups? Well, genetic evidence has demonstrated that in two of these outbreaks, they've actually been caused by pathogens that are human in origin. So perhaps the most likely source of each of these 15 outbreaks might actually be independent introductions from humans. So in conclusion, what we're finding is that there's this really rapid and unpredictable transmission going on within these groups, and they're highly interconnected in the social network. So it's really difficult for us to limit this transmission, because if we cut off one transmission pathway, there'd be so many other alternative routes. But what we do find is that between groups, there's no evidence of transmission going on. So their, their social structure in that regard seems to be protecting them to some extent. So instead, what it seems to show is that actually it's humans that are responsible for these repeated introductions. And that if we want to best protect this population, what we need to do is make sure we are incredibly careful during human gorilla interactions. So things like wearing masks, keeping a, a serious distance when possible, and also ensuring everyone is uh, vaccinated and tested if they can be. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and I'm really happy to answer any of your questions. I need to say a very big thank you to my co-authors on this project, Yvonne Mushimini-Mala, Tara Stuminski, and Winnie Eckhart. And a huge thank you to everyone at the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund who's helped collect this data and make this all possible. And also a thank you to my team in Exeter as well. Thanks for listening.